John Campbell. It's my pleasure to be here today, having been part of the creation that was to become the Monroe Institute. I take particular pleasure in seeing how far it has come, how much it has grown, and how many lives it has enriched along the way. The theme of the 22nd Professional Seminar is Consciousness, the Endless Frontier. As one of the original explorers who has never stopped exploring, I am particularly pleased to have been asked to kick off this 22nd Professional Seminar. We're here because of our association with TMI and because of our interest in creative and useful applications of Hemisync. So I will give you a short description of the genesis of both Hemisync and TMI. Secondly, in consonance with the theme, Consciousness, the Endless Frontier, I will explain very quickly the core of what I have come to understand about the nature of consciousness and reality. Okay. Um, please hold your questions until the end. There's never enough time for questions, and I'm likely to take uh, the lion's share of the two hours allotted to me, but I'm going to be here all day today, tomorrow, the next day, as long as most of you will be here, and I'm very open to, to uh, have meetings. Um, whether it's early in the morning or late at night is fine with me, as long as uh, it's fine with Shirley and it doesn't interrupt with any of the things that are already scheduled for the seminar. So I think we'll have to hold most of the questions until uh, uh, later today or the next, next several days. This is going to be a very quick uh, skim over the top. Actually, it's more like a hop, skip, and a jump uh, across the, uh, the very top of this. Actually, this was a very hard presentation to generate, and not because I had a hard time figuring out what to say, but because I had a very hard time figuring out what not to say and still say within the two-hour time limit. That was the challenge. Now, these slides are going to be busy. They're probably going to have more words on them than you can read. I'm going to go through them very quickly. I'm going to be speaking very quickly so that I can, uh, won't have Shirley mad at me but going over uh, my time. I understand a big hook comes out from somewhere around here if you go past your time. So uh, I'm, I'm motivated to, to get done. So it is going to be quick. Uh, all of these slides are going to be available on my website. You see that, www.mybigtoe.com. Um, so you don't have to copy a lot of things down. You can find the slides. I haven't put up there yet, but I will just as soon as I get a chance to get on the Internet. Also, uh, the slides are on the computer here, so I'm sure TMI will pass them out to you if you have a thumb drive or some way to, to pick them up. Um, so if, if the slides uh, become, a, become a problem for you, trying to read them and listen, stop reading and just listen. Okay? I will say everything that you need to hear, you just let the slides go. They become annoying for you. Okay, first, a little introduction. Now and always a scientist sums it up pretty well. Uh, in college, I, I uh, majored in both physics and mathematics, went on to grad school. Um, Finally did uh, thesis work in experimental nuclear, and now I work for NASA. I do risk analysis, which basically means physics models, uh, system behavior, complex system behavior. So the team that I work on, and it's a fairly large team, what we do is, is try to discover what could possibly go wrong, what the probability is of it going wrong, and then if it does go wrong, how do you fix it? Okay, well, how did, a, how did a, a physicist like me end up, uh, you know, uh, exploring consciousness and being uh, part of the Explorer program early on? Well, once I left graduate school, my, uh, I took a job, and my first boss, Bill Yost, introduced me to Bob Monroe's first book. Well, at that time, this is 1972, early in 72. At that time, it was his only book. And the boss comes out, and he hands me the book, and he says, Tom... I want you to read this and tell me what you think. So I did. I read it. And uh, a few weeks later, you know, I, uh, he asked me, yeah, well, what about this book? And I said, well, there's three possibilities. One, this guy has a good imagination and is just trying to sell books. Two, this guy's nuts. <laughs> three, this guy's sane, honest, and accurate. And there's a whole lot of reality out there that I would love to experience and understand. But how do you know? You know? Unless you meet him and can get a measure of the man, how do you know? You know, is this guy nuts or what? Well, my boss and I both kind of shrugged shoulders and agreed that you know, it was just really impossible to know from reading the book. But uh, evidently, Bill was, was listening. 
And uh, about three months later, he came by and said, hey, Tom, we've located Bob Monroe. He doesn't live that far away. There's a bunch of us going to go out and, and visit him. Would you like to come? And I said, absolutely, I want to come. I want to know whether it's one, two, or three. <laughs> you know? I want to meet this guy. Well, that was, um, like I say, you know, that was more like the uh, spring of 72. And um, toward the end of that meeting, we did meet with Bob, and we spent the whole evening with him. He was very gracious, as usual. And I found out, of course, that it wasn't one or it wasn't two, that Bob was very real. He was very genuine. He didn't have anything to sell. He just wanted to understand what was going on, and he wanted to put it into scientific terms so that he could share it with other people. That was his ambition. And we found out why it is he invited all of us and, and put up with us for a whole evening. Uh, toward the end of the night, we were on the, the back deck of what was called the lab. There wasn't a whole lot in it at that point yet, but uh, you know, with Bob, it was one of those things like, uh, you know, build it and they will come. He, he had built it, and he wasn't quite sure, I don't think, what he was going to do with it at that point. But he looked at all of us, and he uh, kind of scanned us over, and he said, well, you guys are all scientists and engineers, right? And we all kind of looked at each other like, what's coming next? And we <laughs> nodded our heads, yeah. And he says, well, would any of you like to join me here and work in this lab and help instrument it and put it together and study consciousness? Well, it took me about a millisecond for my hand to go in the air. And I said, absolutely, I'd love to do that, Bob. But um, I'll do it if you teach me what you know. <laughs> and he kind of considered that for about another half a second after that. Another hand went up in the air, and it was Dennis Menerick. Um, now you have to understand, Dennis and I were both in our 20s. You know, we were middle to late 20s at this time. And Dennis said, I'd like to do it too, but you know, I want you to teach me what you know. So uh, Bob kind of looked around the rest of the group. I think he really was hoping somebody with a little more stature and experience and <laughs> reputation you know, would take him up on it instead of two kids, uh, you know, not that far out of graduate school. But uh, nobody else uh, said anything at all, so it was a deal. And about three weeks later, Dennis and I are coming out to Whistlefield Farm. We're meeting with Bob, and from then on, we'd meet with Bob like Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We'd get there after dinner, about uh, 7, 7.30. We'd go to the lab, and we'd start building the equipment. There really wasn't a whole lot there. There wasn't any measurement devices for the people. It was just audio in the three booths. So we would build equipment and start uh, figuring out what we were going to do next, you know, experiments and things that we could, we could do at the lab. After about an hour or so, Bob would come up, and then Dennis and I would get in the booths, there were three booths, and uh, Bob would, would uh, begin to carry out his part of the bargain, which is to teach us what it is. We knew there really wasn't a program then. I don't even know that Focus 10 existed then. It, it may have, but uh, certainly uh, nothing beyond that. So, you know, Bob was just making it up as he went, and we were just making it up as we went, all trying to come up with something that would make science out of this. That was our, that was our goal. Well, we did this for... For years, you know, Dennis and I were coming out here probably for, for pretty much straight five years or so. We were coming out three days a weekend. We'd come out on weekends. So you can imagine that um, you know, we were averaging somewhere between 20 and 30 hours a week uh, you know, with the lab and with Bob. So you know, 20 hours a week with Bob Monroe as your personal trainer, you, know, you couldn't help wow. but learn something and learn something pretty quickly. So it, was, it wasn't that long before Dennis and I had pretty well... Um, uh, mastered the uh, altered states. Uh, we were going out of body. We were making uh, non-physical friends and, and people that we could get information from. We were doing experiments. Everything had to be experimental. There wasn't any point in doing anything you couldn't check to see whether it was real or not. So that was the kind of the ground rule. It wasn't just fun and games and have a neat experience. It was, is this real? And it took a while before. It probably took a year and a half or so before I got to the point that I could answer that question with a yes. Um, and that's Everyone has to come to that point somewhere where you decide, you know, is this real?